Welcome back to the Hearthstone Championship Tour. I'm Robert Worthen Wing, joined again by Brian Kibler over here. Brian, we've just witnessed the first half of the matches for the day. Those were all the upper bracket players, and uh, we now have four players that have secured their spot to the Europe Winter Championship next month, and those players are, uh, for those of you at home, Nick Slay, Prokhorov, Dr. Hippie, and now Diggin was the final one, and we're about to enter uh, the lower bracket matches, and these are players who have, you know, lost up until this point and are in the lower bracket, and they're basically fighting for their tournament lives. Yeah, we have four more matches to bring you today, and all of these matches are decider matches. The winner of each of these matches will go to the European Championship next month. Right, it's very much a win or go home, which is an odd thing to say in Hearthstone because you're usually just playing from home, so. <laughs> uh, but all these players, you know, they are really, really want to not only get the, the share of that prize money, but really prove that they're one of these underdog stories that have made it through and uh, we still have, obviously, a couple of big names in there in uh, Crane and Nyman, but otherwise it's a lot of players that maybe necessarily weren't expected to make it this far, and they've made names for themselves. Yeah, a big part of the story of this tournament, I think, uh, has been the, the success of a lot of the more unknown players, and uh, the, the structure of the Hearthstone Championship Tour gives a chance for players who may not have had success in the big stage uh, an opportunity to shine. Right, so obviously uh, up next, Lorkey versus Sarasa. Now, Lorkey, we've actually seen a few times casted, and uh, he's had some really strong lines of play, bringing that control warrior, which is kind of uncommon these days. It's that top-heavy control warrior with the double shield maiden and all that kind of survival mechanics available to him. Sarasa, we haven't seen just yet, but what do you about what do you like about Lorkey? Uh, he's he's shown uh, you know, definitely some some strong conviction and, and passion in uh, in his strategy and just for the game in general. Uh, you know he uh, he shared his his ban and uh, overall uh, lineup strategy uh, yesterday when we were having an interview. Uh, he actually I believe one of his playtest partners was also playing uh, in one of the deciding matches as well, uh, which has been another story we've sort of seen. Uh, it, also I believe Bunny Hopper and Diggin right. uh, practiced together for this tournament as well. So while these may not be players who were known by many coming into the event, uh, they've definitely proven that there are, are strong pairings to watch out for. Right, so obviously we have a lot of Hearthstone go up, or up next the whole second half of the afternoon, so we're going to send it back over to the guys on the desk. Take it away. Thank you very much, guys. We have four more spots left for the Winters Championship. Joining me on the desk is Sotol and D2. You know, we've seen some crazy games today. We had actually one of the most tense games, I think, of the whole tournament. Uh, so what do you think about the current players who are left? Like Lakari we've seen. Do you think he has a good shot of going through Sol? Lakari is uh, definitely in a good spot. Um, as Rob mentioned, or uh, possibly Kibler, he, he was a practice partner of Dr. Hippie, who has already booked his places. So um, Dr. Hippie has already done his job. Lakari now has to step up to that same level. But honestly, my favorite thing about Lakari is, uh, as they were mentioning again, like just so enthusiastic, so happy to be here. Ton of things to say when he was being interviewed, just a really infectious character. Yeah, he's a great character, but he did go down three to zero in his previous match. Gonna have to get bring things together, gonna have to play his best Hearthstone. We didn't see his best Hearthstone in the prior match. As you said, it's still in a great spot here, one match away, but he's also one match from being out. Now, Lakari, when he had his interview, had a lot to say about his general strategy, his thoughts on his deck picks, that sort of thing. But, you know, his opponents could watch that interview and went, OK, now I know how your mind works, how your strategy works. So maybe he uh, kind of jumped the gun a little bit with uh, kind of revealing that information to the world. Um, I don't think it's going to affect him too much. He's already shown that he's a talented young man. You know, he's got uh, the abilities to win in high pressure situations. But his opponent, I know nothing about. So he's a bit of a mystery and that can be dangerous in these kind of open tournaments. Yeah, so it's a, an unknown quantity to us right now, but obviously he's been very, very successful through this bracket. And um, we've kind of harped on the point over the past couple of days, but everyone in this bracket is either a top 100 legend finisher, an open tournament winner, or in most cases, both. Um, so I, every player in this bracket is of extreme quality, and especially to get this far through this bracket in the lower bracket, when so many of the established pro players that have so much respect as, as players drop down into that bracket early, to be at this stage shows a definite quality of Hearthstone play. Yeah, absolutely. Despite all of the pro players going down, it just shows how good the players are that are remaining in the tournament. And like you said, all of these players have earned their way, not just into the tournament, but to this point so far. It's not just like playing on ladder, you know, facing off <laughs> against 2,000 ledgers and like that. These are the top players. They're either top legend or they won a cup. 
And as uh, has been mentioned before on the desk, you know, it's not just, uh, like you said, playing on ladder. You have to formulate strategies. You have to practice with people for tournaments. The tournament environment itself is a very different experience to just sat in, you know, sat in your pajamas, playing ladder, <laughs> listening to dubstep. You know, it's, it's very different. It's a tense atmosphere. They've gone two locations to play in this event. And it looks like these are going to be the decks. We've had a taste of what Lakari has to offer, whereas an opponent, uh, Bit of a mystery. Yeah, and we're looking at mostly a mirror match here. The wrinkle in it is Druid versus Rogue. Lakari bringing the Rogue, Sareza bringing the Druid. And the bans, both Warriors have been banned, which uh, is the most common ban so far in this tournament. Why do you think that is, D2? Why is Warrior such a common ban? Well, it's, it's so powerful against so many decks. I mean, if you're playing Control Warrior, there's so many things you can shut down, like something like an aggressive Shaman, some of the other aggressive decks. If you're playing Patron Warrior, kind of the same story. And it's some of those decks where they're capable of winning in any situation. So definitely understandable to see those bands here. And in particular, I mean, you mentioned Aquablad, that Lakari, he said in his interview, he likes the Warriors, so maybe he's giving up some information there, and maybe Cereza is responding to that. I mean, Lakari already said he will ban Warrior because he just doesn't want to play against it, but I guess if you look at it from Lakari's lineup, uh, he has Rogue, and although we've seen Rogue beat Warrior today, yes. uh, it's not... <laughs> by, by the skin of his team. Against, yeah. against yeah. Lakari. Against Lakari. Against Lakari as well, so... Yeah, he probably doesn't want to uh, run into that issue of that kind of really bad matchup, so banning Warrior is just kind of a no-brainer for him. But like you said, uh, he did reveal he doesn't... Uh, he likes his Warrior, it's his best deck, and he's had that ban. So we're going to actually see Lakari play a new deck, which we haven't seen him play yet. Yeah, and we're just going straight into game one here, and it's looking like we have Freeze Mage from Lakari up against Arena Lock from Sereza, whether it's just a straight-up control, a demon variation, or possibly a Leroy, Leroy Wombo combo variation. Um, but... <sighs> Oh, well, there, there he is. is. Well, if there's any doubt, right? There Obviously, was, yeah. there were the telltale signs with the mind control tech mm -hmm. and the zombie child there. But now we know wow. for certain that is a Reno deck. And I believe this is the first time that in this entire tournament, at least as far as the casting desk is concerned, that we're casting Reno versus Freeze Mage, a very complicated matchup. I'm pretty excited to cast this. I am too. I love this matchup. It's one of my favorite matchups to play. I've played it a ton from the Reno side and a little bit from the Freeze Mage side as well. It's such a dynamic matchup. You feel like on the surface that Freeze Mage should just almost like have no win, no win condition in this matchup because of the Reno, um, but you have the ability to pressure them and they life tap themselves down to a small mar uh, mm. lower life total anyway. And you can kind of threaten that big burst kill before your Alex Straza, and that's your goal. Force, force, uh, threaten lethal. Force them to Reno before you, Alex, then Alex. Speaking right. of Alex Straza, there's one in the Reno Jackson. <laughs> oh, hello. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So probably there in place of Jaraxxus, I would be a bit surprised to see both of those cards that kind of kind of a bit expensive, it's kind of a bit clunky if you have both in your hand, for instance. That's something we saw way, way back in the day, in the early handlock days when you ran both, but kind of people shied away from that. Uh, but yeah, this matchup, I mean, you like you mentioned, sometimes the handlock, or excuse me, the Reno lock keeps tapping itself down. And if there's a Thoris in play, or you Right. to kind of a high amount of mana, then you can burst down from around 20. Yep. So that get, gets really dangerous. The other thing that that Alex Straza could be indicative is that we are looking at more of a Leroy combo type of version. Mm, He's putting yes. that Alex Straza in for the one-two punch, you know, sort of old school control warrior style. Set you down to 15, follow up with the with the Grom Death Bite, but in this case, Leroy Power Overwhelming Faceless. And uh, I'm not sure whether that's uh, of benefit against Freeze Mage or not. Obviously, the burst is great, but the those kind of combo decks are highly tuned to kill you once, mm. whereas Freeze Mage is quite often asking you to kill them three times. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, the Ice Blocks uh, make it awkward for the Reno Jackson lock, especially if you're not running a burst combo. You don't have a lot of damage output, and popping that block can be a nuisance. Ooh. So for someone... Wow. For someone who's played this matchup a lot from the Reno Jackson side, what is the win condition? Like, what kind of steps do you need to take in order to secure this game? It's really scary. It's hard to condense down into small uh, sound bites because there's so many things going on. Yeah, but there's you, many win conditions, right? Right. You really want to ration out your healing is one thing because, as I said, like that Reno is your your ultimate win condition. You need to use that in the emergency on the turn when you're definitely sure you're going to die before. So. Things like Siphon Soul just to gain a few points to pull yourself out, out of the expected range of your opponent. Things like Bran Antique Healbot, if you have that combination in your deck, that can provide you with essentially almost a full heal in a lot of situations without while well, maintaining your Reno in hand. And the really, really important thing is to 
pay attention to Emperor cards, as you as you pointed out earlier, and constantly calculate the amount of max damage your, your Freeze Mage opponent can do, and just play around that exact number. Absolutely. And the thing is, you do want to pressure your opponent as much as possible, just like any deck obviously right. wants to be pressuring the Freeze Mage, unless you have, you know, a Jester card with a Warrior. That's the yeah. one situation where you can just kind <laughs> of sit back, turtle up, right? just harden, right? But uh, in, this, in this particular case, you always really want to pressure the Freeze Mage just to make him, uh, you know, want to make these decisions. And on the back side, if you're ever, if the Freeze Mage ever goes aggressive, you have that Reno in your hand. Absolutely. And that Reno in his hand, of course, is like the ultimate security blanket, right, for any deck in Hearthstone. If you have that Reno in your hand, you have so much information. Um, I guess it's kind of comparable to when you have Ice Block developed as Mage. You have a lot of security in the plays that you want. You know you're not going to die. Um, very, very sort of parallel uh, strategies there. But um, Secret come comes down, and it's turn seven. A certain Goblin is green. <laughs> I was just going to say that we've yeah. gone straight to turn seven here. Like, we've almost not a lot happening. Right. You know, Reno decks are generally quite slow. Yep. So uh, you, you don't have the amount of pressure, say, a Zoo or a Druid can put on this uh, Freeze Mage. And the Freeze Mage is perfectly fine with that. Just, I want to sit here, draw cards. Like, yeah, well, Lakari, he did go for some preventative measures early on. We kind of went, ooh, you saw the knife. When he played the Dooms here pretty early, obviously having the second Dooms here makes a big difference in that situation. But even if there was what? some sort of silence in the hand of Zeray, so maybe he doesn't even silence in that situation because he already has, he just has the Imp King boss. He doesn't on board. lose a lot for a silence, really, do you? You're not gonna, right. you wanna save it for when you have a big board like this. Doomsday comes down, and then this is where silence would be absolutely amazing. And I'm Beak Owl has had a major impact on this tournament in some of the games. Yeah, for sure. Owl has definitely be one of the. Oh, MVPs. oh my Speaking god, I'm so sorry. MVP, I yeah. think Harry. you have the opposite uh, caster's <laughs> curse, I guess. Oh, I guess for Cereza, but. Okay, I'm really, really interested here because there's two ways you can do this. You can owl the Doomsayer, you can owl your Dr. Boom and kill the Doomsayer. And I believe owling the Dr. Boom is strictly better, especially mm. when you have Boom Bots on board. Right. You don't want that 0-7 exactly, hanging exactly. around. So good identification from Cereza to pick up the correct play there. Um, I just wanted to pick up on a point that you made a little bit earlier, Aqua, which is about the Reno Lock being slow. And that is definitely the case. And it's one of the reasons why Freeze Mage can be competitive in this matchup. Because a lot of the time they can afford to chill and just hoard cards for Emperor and get that really big threat of, a, of an OTK burst turn. But that Owl coming down to protect this board that we see right now kind of uh, puts pay to that theory and is forcing the Freeze Mage to react. So one thing we saw this past turn was Cereza using a Dark Bomb on a Mad Scientist to kind of protect his board against something like a Flame Strike. Obviously, the Doctor Boom would have still lived, but mm -hmm. he just wants to protect his board as much as possible. However, that means he has no Dark Bomb for the rest of the game because, we all, as we all know, in the Reno, there's only one of each card. And I do like the Farce here on his face, though, because right now, even if he taps even to 22, I mean, to tw 20 is a bit scary, but against, you know, seven cards, not too bad. But if he keeps tapping, he should be okay, should be able to be bursted down. And then the Alex comes out, he can Reno back up. So there's an interesting point here where uh, Sereza has turned down an offensive Alex Draza on this turn. Right. And what that tells me is that he is going to try and outlast this Freeze Mage. And he's mm. going to potentially use Reno for one full heal, and then Alex Draza potentially for another big pull from, from a low health total back up to 15. So Certainly while... opens up that option for him. He turned down just a straight up nine mana play. Alex Draza, his opponent's face, would have dealt 15 damage. Seemed great at the time, but he chose to tap instead. Well, there also is the other side of the coin where, you know, sometimes you don't have the opportunity to play out of Thoris just because maybe the Freeze Mage is getting a bit aggressive here. Mm -hmm. And just having that utility to be able to, you know, get that on the field and get all of your... He, I mean, he has basically eight coins in hand right now. Sure. <laughs> so that's kind of nice. He can use Alex Draza next turn mm -hmm. and tap on top or maybe even play a mind control tech, a tempo mind control tech. And then on top of that, since his board isn't frozen, he can basically just start applying the damage right away. Right. So you can be a bit more patient from the Reno side. And the one thing with both Doomsay is gone, your hard removal is you have no hard removal left. Right. So you're relying on raw damage alone from flame strikes and uh, blizzards to deal with the board and eventually the Reno Jackson and Locke is just going to drop there stuff with health, Ooh, which they there can't it do. Is. Hello, oh, Leroy. combo time. Um, yeah, but that was just one of the big reasons why I liked an 8-8 on the board that turn so much, because both Doomsayers are gone, so that's that's the kind of the big 
the way that Freeze Mage deals with big things, he's not exactly going to like Fireball, Frostbolt, uh, an 8-8. Eight eight. So just having an 8-8 eight eight in play seemed like a really strong turn. And it looks like he is considering the offensive Alexstrasza this turn. Though. Right, he can bring his opponent, I mean, he has what looks to be 13 damage on mm -hmm. the board, so he brings his opponent down to four yep. health in this situation. Obviously, that Dark Bomb might have been a bit useful here as well to maybe bring <laughs> one, but what can you do? And uh, Soraya's going to cut off a bit of this card draw, playing very conservatively in this situation, but I would like to see his Alex Alexstrasza come down right now. I like it too, you know, take an aggressive stance, put another 8-8 eight, eight down. Ooh, that oh, that low fab wow. amazing as well. So he has an, uh, the he ability has all to the lock. Options. Yeah, he can lock out him out <laughs> with low fab. He's got the, the full heal. I mean, he's looking really good right now. Both Doomsayers are gone, hard removal is uh, not an issue he has to deal with. And now Lakari's got to consider, like, I j just freeze the board and kind of hope. When you start using the damage spells as removal, mm -hmm. it becomes a much worse situation for the freeze mage, right? Especially in this sort of matchup, where you know there's a heal bot, you know there's a what Reno. Yeah, that's so much what damage you eventually have to get through that if you are using spells not to be thrown at your opponent's face, you at least want to have Antonidas down at the same time so it turns into another fireball. Just outright throwing a fireball at that Emperor is a real feels bad man situation for the Freeze Mage because he knows he's counting that total amount of damage and the total amount of healing that he has to beat mm. from a Reno deck. Yeah, I mean, we're looking at the situation. So it's an, obviously an amazing spot. What can Lakari possibly do here? He can't even go for Alex Draza. I mean, the one thing I can possibly think of is he goes for Alex Draza coin. Blood Mage Thanos to maybe pick up some damage. Obviously, we know that the Reno there anyway, but what is his even line here to go for right. in order to finish this game out? Yeah, so he has a maximum of seven damage in hand right now. If he played the Blood Mage, uh, he could draw two Fireballs. He's, um, no, he's like already used a Fireball. He's already used one, right. So it's, so it's, it's Forgotten hard Torch, to, maybe? Yeah, it's hard to even like invent a line where he wins. He's going go to continue to go down the control line. Um, but that Ice Block is looking extremely vulnerable to that Leroy Jenkins in hand, but I don't believe he has any other source of damage to do the one more. I think Forest Sun's one of his only outs here as a Freeze Mage. You mm. need to get the Forest Sun so you can, like you said, get an Antonidas down, start flinging some spells that don't need more fireballs, but then again, does he, have he just time? Heals. Does he have time to do that, though? That's the question. There's so much pressure on board that he... I think he needed to look for a way to to set up a win over the next couple of turns and just pray that his opponent had not drawn his right. Reno. Um, but looking at the situation now, it's just hard to find a win condition because this is everything in hand right now. There's more minions for pressure, there's Leroy for burst, there's a lower theb to lock him out of the game. Like it just does everything. I, I guess we could, what we can do now is look at Sereta's side and and think of what he's thinking about, right? How could he possibly lose this game? What's going through Sereta's mind right now? I mean, is there anything he needs to worry about? I don't think he dies to burst from 22 without a with, without a Thoros and hitting the board. Especially but, having just seen the Blood Mage come down as well. Right, and the Fireball from from previously. So, I mean, I think that Sereta, maybe he goes for... Well, this is actually kind of interesting because... He can't actually clear this Thorson without using Twisting Nether. Oh, there's a the Scythe. Oh, wait, there we go. And you get to heal and yourself. And heal bot, so you can heal back up the full, clear the board. I think if that Scythe installing come off the top there, he, uh, the Lucario would have had a, a much better chance because he's got a lot of uh, one cost, he cost spells, he's got a coin, he could have generated a lot more fireballs, but like, he just finds everything he needs at this point. So the Reno Jackson locks just so far ahead. I don't think 25 is possible, right? You don't no, need to heal that. it's not. Uh, well, after Emperor has come down, one fireball remaining in the deck, nothing else generated. No I don't blood think mage. it's possible. No blood mage. I don't think it's possible. And also, I would like two spots open in the board if I was him, because right, right, right. Uh, he, he can potentially still draw Faceless Manipulator, which will allow exactly. him to pop the block. So. And Lothab, heal bot, something like that. Right, 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 some, right. some fleeing to your face. Yeah. Maybe he wants to go in between, doesn't want to commit to the Reno yet. Mm -hmm. All that kind of stuff. Well, he's going to make four fireballs. Is that going to be enough? There's no time. He's going to lose his block, but he did just draw the second block this turn. Right, that, so that is pretty interesting. Yeah. His eyes will have lit up. He's possibly inventing a win condition for himself now. Exactly. He's going to line this up, but with the hand that we see, the amount of options that uh, Sareza has for disruption, the Reno, the heal bot, and the lower theb, it exactly. seems impossible for him to line up all this burn to, to win the game in time. Right, I and so if we see the Alex Alexstrasza come down here, I think the line from Sareza is maybe go with, well, either Healbot, Lothar, or Lo actually Lothar by itself just, is, just knocks stuff <laughs> it's out. Just but enough, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I mean, maybe you set up for future turns because those cards are pretty expensive, even though they've been discounted a bit. It looks like it's going to be the Antonidas first. Is this all pointed upstairs? No, it's going to be pointed at some of these minions. If he's pointing this stuff to minions, though, I don't know if he has any way. I don't, I don't know if this is a win condition. It's interesting. So I guess his theory here is 
He's he's dealing less damage to face this turn, but he's trying to set up a way where his ice block also survives an extra turn. Right, right. Which right. then allows him to ration out the damage and essentially have more time left in the game. Um, so this makes a lot of sense. He plays the heal bot as well, just to protect that first ice block. And as we can see, as of right now, I believe that block is safe. The Hellfire draw is more damage, but not enough. So, he he, so basically, he, what Lakari is thinking right now is if this Antoninus lives, I have a chance. Right. Mm -hmm. So, Sereza, do you just go ahead and plop down that Leroy to kill it? Uh, I mean, so that's interesting for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, there's multiple ways to kill it, actually. You can go twisting the other. You can yep. go into attack, attack plus Hellfire and Demon Wrath. I think actually twisting the other is not too bad. Whenever you're gonna use that, like this yeah, looks is like he's going for. Oh, yeah, this gonna is gonna go for the twisting other. Okay, there you go. He gets some minion from, <laughs> and the he can put two minions down the board too. He right. Can, he gets a he gets a two drop out here. Wow. Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's the Laura Cacho, and Lakari is thinking, if I fireball now, then he gets those <laughs> fireballs. I mean, strikes are yeah, that's, that. That. that's okay. actually not a bad draw. You, you, as a freeze mage, you have no concerns about giving your opponent a flame strike at any time. Absolutely, there's nothing enough to even use flame strike on for Lakari. And yeah, there goes the flame strike picked up in the hand by Saritza. Saritza is still in a good spot, but I got a hand to Lakari. He's this game looked completely over a few turns right. ago, and it's kind of I can see some sort of glimmer of hope. <laughs> he's for fighting. Him. He's not. He's not giving up. And he did come up with a good strategy, you know, trying to keep the Antonis alive uh, just to get as many fireballs as possible. Didn't work out, but that flame strike was a, a good draw for him to uh, stabilize the board and not have that block be pressured. But then again, once you throw the ball back on the other side of the court, he's got so many options, you know, he can... I mean, has, do he, has he though? That's the yeah. question. Because so, like, you can't just throw away Lothar right, right. here. So th can... I think the biggest thing right here is that, I mean, you know that Lakari has done well for himself when Sarita just can't play any cards out of his hand and win the yes, game. Yes, exactly. actually think, yeah. which is impressive at this point. Yeah, so Sarita is looking at his hand right now and it's like situational card, situational card, situational card, situational card, Twilight Drake. Oh, okay, I guess I played the Twilight Drake then. That's just what it's come down to. Right. But two fireballs are coming down here. He gets his Reno next turn, and then... Yeah, he's trying Lakari. to force the Reno here. Right, but this is the situation I described right the way back at the start of the game, where the Reno is being forced, potentially. There is still options for Healbot, etc. but the Reno is starting to be forced here because he knows there's two more fireballs in hand to, to deal the lethal damage, right. and he's still sat on the Alexstrasza. Exactly, and one thing that's interesting is that... Sometimes you, you don't want to play low for them when they're about to play Alexstrasza, but this might one of those be this might be one of those situations where you loathe to bait out the Alexstrasza potentially. You loathe of Healbot, and then they they're forced to play the Alexstrasza, and then from there you Reno. So that might be what Sarita goes for. It looks like he's going to go for the free tap, quote unquote free tap. Going to go for the Reno. He still could go for well, no, he can't go for the Healbot. Yeah, there's enough mana for Healbot. Well, he, he, uh, he can loathe though because he's not going to die to any sort of fireball, which costs nine mana. Or double fireball, excuse me, and he can't right. die to Pyro Blast. So he could actually still loath up here and be okay. Yeah, and he has a lot of information on the contents of his opponent's Wait, hand. Wait, he's going for a heal bot? 17. Uh, I mean, he's seen. What has he seen? A Frostbolt, Iceland, Iceland? Yes. Has he, have we seen two Frostbolts? In terms of natural burn left in the deck that you would almost guarantee is there, there's one Fireball, one Frostbolt, I believe. There may be Forgotten Torches, there may right. be a Pyro Blast. But right, but not enough mana. Right, not enough mana to ration out. So 17 should be a safe number for him. That's good identification. He does, in fact, play Pyro Blast, and that is going to help him out quite a lot. Wait a second. Could Lakari win this? Pyro Blast right now forces out the Reno, and then we see an Alex Straza plus Double Fireball and Frostbolt. I guess Sarita has stuff to deal with it, right? You can go for the Lothab, mm -hmm. but still, I mean, there's a chance here still for Lakari if Sarita messes up. But if he Lothabs and the block popped, he can just play the block one turn, and the next turn he can fireball, fireball. The problem is, if, if he Pyroblast this turn, he loses his block, so he cannot Alexstrasza next turn, right. because he will need to replay his ice block, so mm. that's an extra turn that isn't going to work. So, How many cards are left in Lakari's deck? Because maybe he goes for Arcane Intellect and Fireball, but then he just fatigues to death. Yeah, you right. can't go into fatigue at this point. Like They're both... It's a, yeah, it's, it's a very thin looking stack. I'm thinking, you know, sub six cards over there. Right. Um, so this is this is tough. I I don't I don't see a, a line that wins him the game here. Well, against smart play, right? Maybe you hope right. your your okay, opponent sure. messes up somehow. That's um that's definitely the way to look out for. And he he also has to consider, you know, maybe that Reno isn't there yet. I mean, I don't know. True. He's yeah, drawn a lot true. of cards, but I don't know he has Reno. So how do I best play around the average situation that I'm up against right now? All right, so he's going to put a lot of pressure on his opponent, and we pr we might see the Reno out here because 
there could be... Is there... I mean, Forgotten Torch hasn't been played, so there's no Roaring Torch. No. So he can actually just loathe him and still live. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that is that is a big boy play, but I believe it would be safe under right because under but every if you if you Reno, then your opponent can well no your opponent can't. cannot Alex this time. Right. So. I mean, I guess if he's really paying attention, if Sirius is really there paying attention, is. yeah. Reno, uh, <laughs> Reno Burlock, he just kind of showed up there. Uh, oh, and there's a fireball, it. by the way. Mm. So yeah, it looks like we are rich. Unfortunately, Lakari can't, as you mentioned, play the Alex Straza and. The ice block on the same turn, really good. I mean, by Cereza just paying attention the entire time, paying attention to which cards I were Thorsten. Right. And if he didn't know that, then he may, may have been afraid of something like an Alex Trazzler plus ice block that turn. So yeah. Cereza really playing solidly here. Of course, slightly disingenuous to say that he cannot play Alex this turn. He can't can't play an offensive Alex this right. turn. He can <laughs> play true, a, true. he can play a defensive Alex Trazzler if he would like to, but it's not that, a winning player. That is seems it? to just be conceding the game. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's a tough spot for Lakari. I mean, we were saying quite early on things look really bad for him, but he did fight really hard to stay in this game. I mean, if uh, if Sarica had made maybe some different decisions, uh, things would have went in, may have went to Kari's favor and he could have squeezed out a win. Uh, but right. yeah, he's going for the defensive Alex and just to see and if he can do anything else. <laughs> Leroy says, I don't care about your Alex Straza. This is going to be game over to Sarica. Very well played by him, showing a lot of patience there, going with the heel bot instead of the the Reno Jackson earlier, Lakari trying to bait it out, but there you are, game one going over straight side. I mean, again, these guys are playing super well. They are, and you can see just how many great resources that Aitza drew to to win that game because he defeated Freeze Mage quite comfortably, you know, with, with roughly a turn, two turns to spare. Still had a lower Theb sat in his hand that he <laughs> exactly. just never had to use. Although Lakari did give him a run for his money. He didn't just like right. stomp him and it just looked unwinnable. Uh, well, we thought it looked quite unwinnable at one point, but Lakari just proved us wrong. He, he came up with strategies and concepts that could potentially beat him the game, but Cerise's, like you said, uh, play was just a bit too solid. Probably indicative of his play from you know, using the control warrior, right? He's used to coming back into games, showed really solid play toward the end. However, on turn four, he played a loot hoarder and a doomsayer, and that might have cost him the game potentially. Yeah, it was definitely a low value doomsayer, and he found himself staring down some some large boards. Obviously, the the top decked owl was huge to deal with that one doomsayer that doomsayer that he did have left. Mm -hmm. uh, but the first doomsayer was used for for pretty low value. But you know, you and I were countering counting him out on turn six, turn seven, <laughs> or something yeah. like that, and he made a really really good game of it going into the later turn. So um, shout outs to him. He's he's still struggling to really make his impact in this tournament in terms of being on stream. Still suffering a little bit. Obviously, he's had great success in his off stream games. Um, but so far, hasn't quite had the rub of the green in terms of his his on-camera performances. I mean, the one thing, if that Doomsayer hadn't been used, like we were talking about how once you use your Doomsayer, you can't deal with the big guys, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe he should have considered that. I might need this for like the Doctor Booms, the Molten Giants, whatever's going to be played. But we know we've talked a lot about Lakari. So, right, so what, what do you think overall is his play? Because this is our first time seeing him. I think just based on that one game, was it was extremely solid. It's it's a uh, it's a matchup we talked about, which is very much about rationing of resources and which cards you need for which turns, and you know rationing out the amount of turns remaining in the game and how to use your healing. And he navigated it really well. At no point was he in a situation where, oh, if the mage has this, then he would have lost. He was safe every single turn right. for the entire game because of how he navigated. He it. had options to spare, like you mentioned. With that <laughs> yeah. If too anything many goes wrong, yeah. so I have this. So yeah. So we go into game number two here. Lakari is going to have his work cut out for him again as he cues into one of Freeze Mage's worst matchups, I would say. Yeah. Other Mitch, than the other than the control warriors. Other than, other than, the, the, other than the control warriors, which you can almost just write off because <laughs> that's that that matchup is concede percent. That's that's the matchup <laughs> rating. Um, this is a very very tough matchup, very heavily favored for mid range druid, but it is not unwinnable. Like the control warrior matchup is is generally considered to be. They can get some things done. It generally relies on huge doomsayers and whiffing on keeper of the grove early on. And we see unfortunately that there are two doomsayers, but there is also a keeper of the grove. Uh, one thing to consider as well is like this is uh, this is tournament life. Like Lakari yep. uh, finished so strong yesterday with that confident interview, and then uh, he kind of had kind of a crippling loss, a free zero. So now you know s s there's so much pressure on Lakari to uh, win this and go forward and become a top eight. Uh, and Sarit said, like on the other hand, like we haven't seen him play on stream yet, and he is cool as a cucumber. He is just like just chill. He seems to be really confident. 
Oh. Yeah, maybe being on maybe being on stream too many times can be detrimental, right? But uh, yeah, Saddle, I think I know what you're thinking he <laughs> might have gone for the coin innervates Thoris in yeah. there. I think he was afraid of something like a fireball come out. It's kind of an I easy mean, response to it. He could sure. go for it now because now he kind of knows that there's no real response. He kind of figured there's going to be something like a frostbolt coming out to challenge this, but I suppose okay. he wants to get more value. Maybe he wants to get, you know, a force of nature discounted I, here. I think what this means is that he sees his curve as innovate Dr. Boom into Emperor. I think that's mm. what this means. Um, otherwise, I'm not sure what you're holding on to the innovate for. But yeah, I would have loved to just jam Emperor down on that board as early as possible and just make the Freeze Mage have the answer. Yeah, I would have liked that too. But like you said, maybe his line of play was to have that kind of Dr. Boom on turn five and curve into the six. Of course, that plan has been ruined. Doomsayer does get silence. He does deal with that. Uh, do you think things would have been different if he had the discount? Uh, I'm not sure how much it would have changed. He would have sped up uh, a couple of cards, but... Um, generally, just just having the Emperor there would have required a different line from from Lucari as the Mage player because he can't leave it there over multiple turns. So he would have immediately have to switch his mindset from regular Freeze Mage play, which is you know deny damage, draw cards, etc. He would have had to go straight Tunnel Vision into okay, how am I removing this Emperor? I suppose he wanted to just ration out what he's doing, right? Because Freeze Mage is one of those decks where you can kind of completely annihilate your opponent's board, and if you get the Thoris out early, maybe you're forced to kind of just play everything at the same time, and that can be problematic especially if the Thorson is immediately removed sure. by a fireball. So I think he's just rashing out of stuff saying, okay, if I get this, if I get this Pile Trader on the board, it's almost impossible to have both sides die. I can get some damage in and everything works out from there. And looks like he's gonna go for, I believe, a Thoris and Innovate Hero Power Play. Right, just just use Innovate as a good old Moonfire here. <laughs> Zero mana <laughs> deal one damage. And take take four, right? <laughs> yeah, sure, whatever. Oh, yeah, he is going yeah, for it. He, went, he did it the other way, Ryan. Yeah. So this discount is going to be pretty nice. Let's hit, hit a Savage Roar, which is uh, very important. Dr. Boom, I mean, he's coming to turn seven. I don't think it makes a huge difference overall. But yeah. we see another Frost Nova Doomsayer coming down. No silence this time. Uh, but that might not be enough when you kind of pack a Dr. Boom straight after. Right, and the important thing that this Emperor did, is, well, amongst many things that Emperor does, is it prevented the Flame Strike, really. Even though the Flame Strike would have been discounted to six, still wouldn't have been enough to deal with the Emperor. So he's essentially protecting the rest of his board by saying, Emperor, this is such a high value target, you can't afford to Flame Strike and leave this here. But unfortunately for him, Frost Nova Doomsayer number two comes down. Yeah, that's pretty nice there from Lakari. Also has those discounted minions. So once this goes away, he can go and take the initiative and play the Alex Strauss in the following turn. And that's a definite line of play that can win, unlike the last game. Let's see what Sarasa goes for here. Looks like he's going to go for the Wild Growth. I kind of like maybe going for that Ancient Lord to pick up some cards here, but mm. just going to favor the mana. And I mean, look, Sarasa was looking great at the beginning, but a couple of Frost Novas, a couple of Doomsayers later, and Lakari is in an awesome spot. Other than being low, low but low on cards, it's great for him. Akari just needs to find a couple more damage Ooh. spells, like a fireball, for example, and then I mean, it gets the Alex. Wow. I mean, the glorious thing about this is that normally when you're making your Freeze Mage calculations as to how you're rationing out your damage, you never bank on Alex Straza being able to hit face. Yeah, it's, exactly. just, it's not something that you rely on, but that is a very real prospect here, unless BGH? a big game hunter is drawn. And, and it's it not. No BGH. I mean, wow. this is just absolutely devastating here for Sarita. Gonna go for the inner rate talk to him. Not so you see He's every dead. day, but it doesn't matter, right? I mean, Pyroblast and the Alex Straza. <laughs> Lakari is saying, "Hey, not bad. This is pretty good for me here. I think gonna take the game. That was one of the quickest freeze mage versus druid say, games I have ever seen." I, you usually see a quick game when it's freeze mage druid from the druid side. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not exactly. the other way around. So wow, Lakari making a great comeback in this series, tying up to one-one. Immediately respond to that last with like, you know, what, I'll just win my bad matchup. You know, I'll, I'll make up for it. It's just such a swag ending as well. Like the druid just drops 14 <laughs> manners worth of stuff on the board. <laughs> the freeze mage goes, ah, oh, that's cute. Here's a pyroblast. <laughs> yeah, two turns of Ember Thoris and how about just kill your face? You know, yeah. it seems pretty good there. And there, I mean, obviously he had a nice hand there for Lakari, but you know, showing he can take out a favorite matchup like Druid. He's, he said he's taking it out with Control Warrior. Now he takes it out with a Freeze Mage. So now he has his Rogue and Warlock going into the next two games. Um, was his Warlock to do? I think it was, if I remember rightly. From Lakari. From Lakari. Saritza's uh, Mage is still a question mark, right? We have not seen it. Could be Freeze. We've seen a, enough tempo as well. Mm -hmm. So if you were going to go and line some matchups now, I mean, Druid does nice against the Rogue. Uh, Zoo is a bit awkward. Um, what about Mage, though? Mage versus the Rogue and the Warlock. The one thing, though, is that once you win an unfavored matchup, be it, you know, 
last hero standing or conquest it puts you in such a great position so i mean we saw lakari i was going to mention it but at the beginning of the game he looked pretty stressed out that he picked wrong right yeah. he had he's getting the freeze mage against the druid a matchup he did not want but then from there now he's won now all these options are open up for him in these next two games next three games potentially that's absolutely true winning unfavored matchups is is very much the key to winning tournaments and it's something that you have to really endeavor to do if you want to be a top hearthstone player because it's how you get your edge you know you can't just go through tournament after tournament winning the games you're supposed to win losing the games you're supposed to lose unless you have a perfect lineup <laughs> right. right unless you unless you <laughs> completely lineup, scored right. everyone and met game the tournament perfectly <laughs> but most often that isn't going to work you're going to have to find some way to sneak you know a five percent advantage out of a matchup that you're not supposed to have it in absolutely yeah. strong play from lakari i'm pretty impressed he came back you know in a, a high pressure situation where your tournament life is on the line you could be going to california to you know play in a massive tournament the first big hearthstone tournament of the year uh yeah, there's a lot of pressure for this guy, and it looks like he's gone into a zoo lock. He's going to be playing against a Freeze Mage, so uh, no Temple Mage coming out. And Freeze Mage generally can do pretty well against zoo if it finds that Freeze, those Doomsayers, and those Flame Strikes and Blizzards later on. I'm I'm half disappointed and half relieved that we didn't see Freeze Mage versus Freeze Mage. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> it's such an interesting matchup to go. I mean, obviously, there's that icon iconic moment from Oskaka when he pinged his O's face, and it was the correct move. And, but at the same time, you see a lot of hero power passing, a lot of throwing away Hello. flame strikes for nothing. So yep. uh, at least we're having a bit more of a dynamic matchup here. Yeah, absolutely. And this is a pretty nice looking opening curve here from Lakari. He has uh, the aggressive minion in the form of the, the knife juggler that he's just going to coin out straight away and just ask his opponent for a frostbolt, which Cereza does have. But on top of that, he has multiple sticky minions, which are what you really want as the zoo player. Build that repetitive damage that's hard for the mage to AoE down, even with a Frost Nova Doomsayer. You need to ensure that your board is not going to be cleared by one AoE. And, you know, Nerubian Egg and Haunted Creeper, like you said, are perfect examples of those cards which will just make AoE clearing awkward. And that's what you want to make to, to make, make the Freeze Mage do. Have awkward situations where your board will be sustained after AoE. Oh, oh. that's now off the top. Hoot, hoot, he's back. <laughs> but do use it now, though. I mean, obviously right. it's a bit weak. Uh, it's not really. No, I don't think you use it yet. Right. I mean, you, later on, denying that Doomsayer later on the game or potentially silencing your own minion to get that damage in mm -hmm. can be very valuable. Absolutely. And, I mean, you're making your board bigger anyway, so it's... Yeah, exactly. Look at the board state you leave behind. <laughs> like, even if you owl it, you have a 3-2 and a 2-1 and you're out and owl. If you play Nerubian, like, you have a 4-4. Like, you really haven't lost that much right. at all. Yeah, not 4 4 sticking around. So, yeah, nice to see the Nerubian egg come down noticing that, you know, I don't lose anything at this point, and now he can rebuild the board after seeing a Doomsayer. Uh, it's gonna, it might be unlucky to hit another Frost Nova, a Frost Nova and a Doomsayer, mm -hmm. but that's the last Doomsayer then. And once that's gone, some of the more heavier hitter minions uh, with more health than, say, uh, Blizzard can deal with will stick around. Yeah, having said that, I don't mind that the Tempo Doomsayer from Sarezza there at all. Like, it's it's only really punished by Nerubian Egg, because as we discussed, the Owl isn't even really that good in that situation. Right. And his common way to kill it would be like power overwhelming. So he's not going to power overwhelm his juggler to kill a Doomsayer. Like, doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. You and just let it die anyway. Yeah, and it just shows how good Lakari's opening hand was, right? right? He had sticky minions and he had threatening minions. Yeah. We talked about this yesterday a bit, but if you're playing against a control deck as the zoo, if you unless you're playing something, you know, like a warrior that has the fireworks to take it out. If you don't put damage on the field right away, the control player can just sit back and say, okay, whatever, do whatever you want. I'm not gonna, I don't need to respond to this. You never want to let any control deck have that opportunity to sit back. You want them to be always trying to scramble for ways to deal with the pressure you're doing. And right now, the carry's doing a fine job of putting pressure on this freeze mage. And these, these minions are pretty devastating to deal with. He does have a blizzard but it doesn't kill everything. Yeah, and Lakari identifying the, the on-curve AoE play here from Cerezo, which is going to be Blizzard. So he chose to take a little bit of a slower turn, doesn't develop his Peddler since it's a perfect Blizzard target, and instead just goes with the Haunted Creeper, which actually gains power if Blizzard has cast. So um, very strong play there from him. And I think I even know. though the Blizzard isn't as perfect as it could be, uh, Cerezo yeah. is more or less forced to use it here. Yeah, Blizzard still is pretty nice here. If you go for Frost Nova Ice Barrier, you're really leaving yourself open to something like a Lothab later on. Sure. I mean, Lothab, basically, Lothab needs to come out next turn, or, you know, you can still do stuff as as the Freeze Mage by playing that Frost Nova, which is very valuable in the situation. So, in a lot of cases, Frost Nova is actually better than Blizzard. I mean, for many reasons, right? It's cheaper, and you get to cut off their 
everything from their board without potentially killing anything. Mm -hmm. So I like not using the Frost over there. Going for the Blizzard puts two damage on the board, but I think he'll live with it. I think the thing he's thinking about now is nice Flame Strike is the obvious follow up here. Yeah. I like that he's taunted up the two one ones because now he's pushing more damage. So if Flame Strike comes down, it comes down. You can't do anything about it, and then you just replenish <laughs> the board. Speaking of Flame Strike, that. speaking of Flame Strike. Oh, there strike. it is. Yeah. I, 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 I need to stop doing Cast this. Curse. But you know what? What this is illustrating is the importance of those sticky minions in this matchup. We saw before last turn the Horny Creeper died from the AOE, and that gave still active targets in the form of the Spectral Spiders on the board for things like Defender of Argus, Dark Iron Dwarf, etc. And now this turn with the in-game boss, same thing. If he wanted to play Dark Iron Dwarf and push some extra damage, he still has that target there in play to do that on. And Lakari identifying that he obviously just saw the Flame Strike, saw the Blizzard the turn before. So now that that's happening, going to put some less sticky minions on the board. We're going to fill it right up, though. It's a tough spot here for the Freeze Mage, you know. He's just slamming AoE after AoE, and now he's just trying to stay alive, trying to survive, gonna play this scientist to try and at least compete with a minion. But as we can see, you know, there's a Mortal Coil in hand there as well, so he's got a... He didn't ping the 1-1. One -one. It I, looks like he's going I, for the de kill here. Yeah, he's I just really like this ping going face, because if you look at his hand, Double Ice Lance Pyroblast. He's only a, really a Frostbolt away from being able to threaten the damage here over a number of turns. He does have to find some way to protect his Life Turtle in the meantime, but he has a Frost Nova to help do that. Um, so the offensive play of lowering his opponent's Life Turtle is definitely something he has to keep in mind. I think he actually wants the board to compl be completely full for right. turn 10 when he can go Antonine's Frost Nova and no way to deal with it. Yep. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense. And uh, no IMB Cow can be played in that situation. No Lower Theb, no Doom Guard, etc. Wow. Owl coming out here, potentially. Uh, it would be a pretty nice play that we can see in Straits' oh. hand. Yep. And Lakari realizing that his opponent only has five, soon to be six cards in him. So cutting off this, you know, basically oh. this card. Well, I don't know if you play Flame Imp here. You don't want to. Once your uh, opponent pings face, you must be thinking, he's going to go for a kill turn soon. Yeah. Like, he's not waiting around anymore. He's done his clear, and he's hmm. uh, going to have to find a win. Looks like Lakari has put his opponent on having AoE here rather than what we, what we can see in his hand because what he's done, I mean, he... Oh, wow. <laughs> Frostbolt to the face. <laughs> this is so Frostbolt. brave. Wow. This is so brave. I don't, I don't know whether it's bravery or folly, but he's going to commit as much stuff as he possibly can. And there is no activator for that Ice Lance yet. Of course, we did see a Frostbolt used early on on a Knife Juggler, so there's probably only one live draw in his deck to activate those Ice Lances. And this bravery from Lakari to not only tap that turn, but also play an additional Flame Imp uh, may end up paying out, although the Blizzard does come down and put a little bit of a stop to that, but Nerubian Egg is here to play the spoiler. Right, so Lakari had the read on Serita that there was AoE, and as it turns out, he picked it up <laughs> off the top. Do you go with the Blizzard here? I mean, as we saw, I mean, that Owl is actually very big right now. There's no Ice Block up for Tsaritsa. We have a ton of damage on board. Could he possibly die? Let's count it up, I suppose. There's uh, 10 damage on board and 9 mm. in the hand of Lakari. What What if you were to Antonidas and Ice Lance two minions? Because uh, then, essentially, if you can force yourself to stay alive for two turns, you have Pyroblast and two Fireballs in hand to yeah, spend like over that. the next two turns. Right. You know, he's setting up uh, enough damage from uh, Antonidas, like you said. You will have enough damage to kill him. And if Lakari is forced to tap in any situation to find answers here, uh, he'll just be securing uh, Freeze Mage's victory. Uh, I like this play. Just, I was just thinking of it while you were mentioning it. Like, just go for the Antonidas, make him deal with the Antonidas, and know that there's damage in hand ready to finish him off. Yeah, absolutely. In this situation, it's impossible to both kill Sarit. Oh, I guess there's no Ice Block, so if you can kill him, you kill him. <laughs> but uh, it, you, it's impossible to kill Sarit, and you have to use a lot of damage into the Antonidas, and that gives him even more time. Yeah, I mean, he's really not that far off. He has what was reasonably expected as the maximum damage so when you're considering, you know, do I die to Zoo here? What do you think of? You think of Power Overwhelming Doom Guard, and right. that's exactly what Lakari has, but we can see it's not enough in this situation, so he's going to have to respect this Antonidas. Absolutely, and it looks like it's going to be the power bombing on the owl. Let's see how he goes for it. It's going to be the mortal coil, which he got off the peddler earlier. It'll help him start picking up some more answers potentially. Abusive oh. sergeant's reasonable. It's not the greatest though. And if you put on maximum pressure with the doom guard, you're running out of just stuff. Right. Is he highlighting tap there? Wow. You must. You must like. 
Cerise's a line of play has been so aggressive since that ping to face. Yep. You must be suspecting some form of burst damage in his hand, ready to finish the game off. I mean, you have burst damage of your own, but like you said, it wasn't enough. I mean, it's a heads-up play from Saritza, being able to freeze those minions, and now he's just going to try and push. And again, he's going for the kind of sticky minion line of play. He's going to fill the board here as well, right. which means Frost yeah. Nova potentially locks this game out, even if Loatheb is drawn next turn. Wow, There's, yeah. There is so no game, target for Is the it. game just over? I, I believe so. <laughs> yeah, he just Frost Nova, Fireball, ping. Yep. There's no room for Loatheb. Power Blast next turn. Yep, I think GG. that's it. I think that's just GG, GG right there. <laughs> yeah, we need the GG button right here to help us out. I think Lakari draw wins. it. Draw it. Oh, Go on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a sadist at heart. I enjoy oh, no. seeing other You're people cruel. suffer. You're yeah. so cruel. So. I just want him to draw the Lurth and have that moment of realization of, oh, whoops. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. There well, it go. wouldn't have mattered anyway. Lothab didn't come, and Zareza is able to take that game. He goes up 2-1. We've had some really good freeze match plays so far. I think Lakari was a bit nervous towards the end there because he tapped last as well. So he, he kind of he didn't really know what he he wanted to do because he kind of played a few things and he stopped and he was just like, oh, I guess I'll play the Haunted Creeper and stuff like that. And I think he, he knew that uh, Sarisa had the stuff he needed to finish the game, but he didn't have an idea in his head on how to win himself. Yeah, it was the indecision more than anything. You know, we we can say, you know, we didn't agree with the taps, we didn't agree with the flaming, you know, wh whatever. But he was very, very indecisive. You could see his mouse movements. He was, you know, maybe this, maybe I life tap, maybe I play the flaming. You know, there wasn't any clear strategy at the start of each turn as to what he was going to do. Um, and I think that you know, you can put that down to nerves, where he just, you know, all that all that instinct, all that built up match up knowledge that you gain over months and months and years has just kind of deserted him, and he was trying to work things out again. I'm gonna throw Lucario Bone here. I mean, it it could be that whatever he did, he couldn't have won that game. It is an unfavored right. matchup, yeah, yeah. and there were a lot of options in the hand of Cereza there. So I'm gonna just kind of <laughs> lay off on on you know saying any misplays there from Lucari, and you know he's still in this. Unfortunately, that game didn't go so well for him. And let's, like you said, from a bone here, he is in probably the highest pressure situation in his competitive gaming career. It's not easy to uh, recognize, uh, say, plays and situations. Uh, nerves do uh, affect players, and these guys, uh, you know, up and comers at this point, you know, they've uh, made their mark in this tournament, and there's a lot on the line. One of these guys is going to the top eight, you know, he's going to have a chance of a lifetime to compete, maybe in a country he's never even been to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's so much pressure on both these players. So, you know, Lakari, I still believe he has the stuff to take this uh, series, but Saritza's looking really strong too. Yeah, absolutely. I no intention to be that hard on Lakari here at all. You know, everyone everyone suffers in these high pressure situations. You, know, you can go back to the oh. the first major I intended and dig out footage of me playing like absolute garbage. <laughs> I promise you it happened. Um, so yeah, but Lakari still has a very, very nice aggressive start here with a flame imp against Druid. One of the things you want, you generally don't really want those those low power, ignorable minions against Druid early. You want to get in there nice and deep and like get the pressure going early. Get the free twos out. That's uh, what we're after. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing at all. <laughs> anyway, so my, my groan earlier was because he didn't pick up the flame quite yet and he had a pretty poor hand. Yep. And are we going to see the Voidwalker and the Beast of Sergeant here? Obviously, he'd be relying on the next card off the top to help him out in the following Why turn. It's interesting because holding back on the Abusive Sergeant is a little bit better against Adonis' Aspirant coming down right. on turn two. Um, he can kill it either way, but it's a difference between having a 2-1 on the board and not having a 2-1 on the board. So, mm. uh, interesting decision whether to hold it or not, but uh, no Aspirant in sight and said we're going to get an Innovate Shredder, and he's probably well, a little thankful that he has the extra board presence, but again, he could have used the Abusive to trade up if he'd have wanted to. What right. do you think I of mean, the Innovate Shredder here over a coin uh, shade? Well, the thing is, if you play the shade, you're under a lot of pressure to start clearing your opponent's minions, and then from there, it's basically just a 3-3, three, three, right? So I like the extra pressure from that Shredder. It obviously Obviously has a second body, so I like to play here from Saritza. He can play out the, sh the shade right here. I imagine you don't go for the wild growth. You saw him hover over it right now, but yeah, I really like the shade here. You can play the wild growth later potentially. Yeah, absolutely. Like that wild growth is a it's a slow card, particularly against Zeus. So you need to find breathing room to play it. Sure, uh -oh. sure he was in a strong position that turn, but developing this shade against an empty board means he's going to be in an even stronger position next turn. To cast Absolutely. The and Lakari just can't buy a break here. I mean, last turn, he taps into a 3-drop and then picks up another 3-drop on top of that just to, you know, rub it in. And then now he has to play a naked Gormok, naked in the sense that he doesn't get the extra damage He's just off. totally naked, man. <laughs> no, no clothes on, nothing. And you always want... 
one combo I love in this Azu deck, which has been developed recently, is the brand Gormok combo. That just feels incredible. <laughs> it just feels amazing. And unfortunately, he he's not going to have an opportunity to play that. And Sarita's is the one with the, the board pressure here. He's kind of right. doing Zeus's job. Let's play all the little guys, Dan. And that's scary no matter what deck you're playing. Even if you're playing an aggressive deck, it's probably even more scary if you're an aggressive deck because you have to start trading with your opponent against the Druid. What do you think about not coining the Wild Growth out here? I mean, obviously, you're not guaranteed to play with the Force of Nature next turn, but mm -hmm. he could have gone Force of Nature into the Ancient Lore. Absolutely, and it turns out that, you know, just, just how things have lined up, that Force of Nature would be pretty great this turn. So he can still coin it out here, but it's at the expense of then not being able to Ancient of Lore on the following turn. So uh, he's going to go... He does pick up Wrath, though. So he does he pick up Wrath, which, which mitigates the damage a little bit. So he's going to go ahead and use the Wild Growth here. Wrath down, presumably the Gormok. And I think... The dog I think might you coin out a hero like... power too, right? Because because what you can do, you can clear the entire board. You can go and wrath at Gormok. Right. You can kill off the dog. Yeah. Kill off the Im King boss. Use your hero power. And Zoo is really weak when it doesn't have stuff on the board to pump up. Mm -hmm. yep, yeah. No mortal coils. Soul fire only comes from Peddler, so anything that kind of sticks around is reliant on knife juggler hits, uh, implosion, and generally. So you know, have very limited ways to to deal with things on low health on the board without having a board of its own. Right, so yes. we're, in like, we're in a similar position to if he had done the Wild Growth prior turn, so eh, no harm, no yeah. Pretty Pretty much comes out in the wash, but you know you're in a good position as a Druid when you're two minions ahead of Zoo, right? <laughs> like, this is not a place you're used to being as the Druid player in the Zoo matchup, but he's going to drop this Knife Juggler here, Lakari is, and Sareta is going to shut his eyes and hope that it's not being followed up by Implosion. Okay, he's going to relieve a bit of the stress and just tap first. Uh, but once, if he'd have played that knife juggler with four mana then left open, <laughs> Sarazer would be, oh, please, please, no implosion. Right. Oh, oh wow. nice, nice. Gets yeah. the hit off very nice there. And Sarazer might have to hold off on that Ancient Lore because, I mean, getting your shade a bit bigger here could be a priority. Maybe he uses that Force of Nature right now. I quite like the Force of Nature. Keep the shade growing. It's still a threat that uh, Lakari has to deal with. And, you know, you have minions ready to play after this turn. Uh, you got plenty of card draw coming up. Keep the board clear. Let that shade be a hassle. Yeah, I think we've established based on that previous turn there is no implosion in hand. And even now, your, your shade is big enough to potentially survive the implosion. So just getting into this situation where you're just slamming damage with that minion and the Doom Guard is going to be forced to use here defensively. Well, the Doom Guard did survive the second one that is and are we going to see a tap here from Lakari? I don't like a tap. I don't see too much value in it because right, you your, can't hand play is, your hand is Doom Guard. So <laughs> right, you can't play two minions most of the time. You can't play two minions and the Doom Guard right. and then get all that value out anyway. So you're probably going to be throwing away a card. And oh, wow. Wow. Oh, that's a great pickup. So you can clear the Doom Guard, leaves the 4 4 on the board, and now the second Doom Guard is going to probably have the same job as the first one of clearing minions. Absolutely, but you know, we can keep throwing Doom Guards into minions all day here as Lakari, <laughs> yeah. but Sarasa just has so much gas to keep going. Yeah, he just needs to pick up any damage, and the game is basically over. And that is one of the worst, basically, the worst draw in Lakari's entire deck there. He can't even play it right now. He probably has to tap anyway, just so he can refill his hand because how is he going to do 31 damage without cards yeah that's it's a, a very, that's good, a very good question <laughs> yeah. yeah cards cards are quite good in terms of dealing damage and there's a savage draw so one uh piece five damage off lethal yeah. um, <laughs> he just needs a druid to claw now he doesn't even just need exactly. combo it's just any oh there you go there so combo is sitting yeah. in hand ready it's looking like the beginning of the end here for Lakari. Maybe even the end of the end, I'm not sure. But Sarita looking to be in fantastic shape to take this game. There's a Dark Iron Dwarf. Unfortunately, it's not going to be doing anything because that Dark that Doom Guard has to trade into the I Ancient of Lore, Dark Peddler first. <laughs> Can't oh, corruption man. that because it'll just kill you <laughs> before it dies. Uh, corruption, good card confirmed. But yeah, <sighs> Lakari here, of course, just going through the formalities, trying to find the best play in the world where his opponent does, doesn't have lethal. But we can all see that the game is over here. We go ahead and Dark Iron Dwarf the Ancient of Law before trading since it makes damn no difference. And we're just going to see the classic the four combo. Druid combo come down here, seal the series as it sealed so many series in the past. Oh, no. <laughs> all right. No. So oh. Rita is now our finalist. He's to be going into the top eight of the Winters Championship. Big congrats to him. He played so solid during that series. 
He really did, yeah. Very, very impressive. Not someone that we've featured on the broadcast so far, but for a first time showing, very, very impressed, DT. What do you think? Yeah, there are almost no plays that we disagreed with. Even some plays that we maybe didn't see and he just pulled out anyway because they were the correct play there. Right. Showed fantastic restraint in that first match. He had so many options to spare when going against that freeze mage, was able to navigate that perfectly, and he made it the hard way through the loser's bracket. He had to win so many more matches to get through there. Yeah, absolutely impressive play from Saritza. And the Kari also showed some impressive stuff during his time in the tournament. It was unfortunate for him that he did not go through. Yeah. But, you know, this is a good starting point for the Kari, you know, to uh, develop himself as a maybe potentially a professional Hearthstone player if he keeps going forward and enter in these tournaments and find some wins. Yeah, it's just a rough break for him. He's obviously performed extremely well, not only to, in this tournament to get up to the top eight position, but also over the previous two months to gather the necessary points to be here in the first place. Just so happens that when the camera was turned on him, it just wasn't his day. Didn't get the run of the draws. Maybe one or two arguable mistakes here and there, but um, obviously a little bit nervous, but he'll be back. He'll be stronger. I hope we see more of him in the future because he's also just a very interesting character. Yeah, definitely an interesting character. I mean, unfortunately for him, not third time lucky this time, third time <laughs> on stream in this case, but Saritza is able to take it out. I mean, First time on stream, played excellent. I want to see more of this guy, honestly. Mm -hmm. And he was cool. He was calm. Like, right. he had the poker face going on. You know, there wasn't a, a lot in kind of emotional reactions to things. You know, he kept his cool during the matches, and he was rewarded for it. He just played solidly. Just top, just going to the European Winter Championships, no biggie. You know, yeah, nothing, <laughs> to <it>. <laughs> <laughs> nothing to it. I do it every day. It's fine. So, yeah, so he is one of five current top eight players. So far, we have Dr. Hippie. Uh, Pok Rovac, is that? Is Pok Rovac. Pok Rovac, yep, one of those interesting names. Nick Slay, Diggin, and now uh, Saritza. So we have three more spots for players to go to the Winters Championship next month. You know, this is an exciting time for these players in Hearthstone. You know, we've uh, the big story of this tournament is obviously that the pros have fallen, the new blood is rising, you know, all the new talent is coming through. And, you know, I think I'm quite excited to see what these players bring in the championship. Yeah, me too. I, I I love seeing new blood. I knew I you know the the scene will only continue to flourish and grow if there are more and more players coming in and stepping up and being top players. And that's what we need. We need more top players. We need more options. We need more people exposing their skills. So these guys coming in, you know, especially the ones who we've seen play on stream in you know really exciting st uh, sets and really excellent sets in terms of exhibiting skill. Those, those games have just been awesome to watch. Yeah, and if we get more players, then the pro players have to raise their games right. once more to get yeah. there. Yeah. I've seen <laughs> a lot of Twitter wars lately between the pro <laughs> players and some of the people calling them out. So they got to raise up their game if they want to stay on top. There's, uh, there's, there's drama on Twitter, are you sure? Uh, never, I've never, never, I, I've I, never I, seen I, that I was happen. totally wrong about that, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we're going to head over to Frodan, who's going to interview Saritza on his victory. Thank you very much, Aqua, and the rest of the guys on the caster desk. I am going to be joining Ceriza with a quick interview to talk about his journey uh, through the winter prelims. And so far, we have five out of eight players, and right now, number five is about to join us on the line for a quick couple of words. Ceriza, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Awesome. So let's get to know a little bit more about how you're feeling right now, and now that you've qualified for the winter finals, what's it like right now being you? Yeah, it's amazing, man. Uh, I was not expecting at all. Uh, I mean, it's really hard to get here, I guess. And yeah, I just feel amazing. It's awesome. Awesome. I mean, you you just mentioned that how difficult it is to get through this tournament. I mean, some people pin this as one of the hardest tournaments yet. Uh, but specifically for you, what's the journey like being able to qualify as a player that people weren't really expecting go through and, and now beating all these tough opponents? Was it Was it a really difficult process for you? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I was really nervous at the start, but then stuff started going on my way and, yeah, started to chill a bit and everything went for the better, I guess. It was awesome. You know, the entire process of the... Oh, sorry. Yeah, absolutely correct. Uh, didn't mean to cut you off at the end there. Uh, so the uh, entire no process of the Hearthstone Championship Tour is to kind of make a point that anybody can kind of do it and that any person that's, you know, whether they're playing on their iPad or they just discover Hearthstone for the first time um, can actually get to this point and go to the finals. Do you have any advice for any up-and-coming players that are being inspired by all of these dark horses that are running through? Um, 
I don't know. Uh, I think, I mean, just play the game. If you love the game, you will get there. Uh, I didn't really need to expend very money in this game, and a lot of people doesn't do not uh, play because they think it's pay to win, and it's not really. Uh, if you love it, you will get there. Uh, I wasn't expecting to get here, to be honest. I had some luck last game. Just, just do your best, man. If you think you can do it, you probably will. Yeah. Just be, yourself, yeah. Just be yourself. Just be yourself. That's that's yeah, absolutely what it's all about, best, man. Yeah. Awesome. Great. So uh, let's just go ahead and give some final words and shout outs. I mean, you already gave some very nice, inspiring words to, to wrap it up there. But is there anybody like to thank uh, about being successful to get to this point? Yeah, I would like to, to thank to my team uh, for the winning sports. They really they really helped me to, to get here. Uh, all the support, you know, and and yeah, I would like to, to thank the to Meltdown Lisbon that gave me really, really great opportunity. Yeah, it's, yeah, just Meltdown and my team, I guess, and my family as well. Awesome. And is there a special Valentine's Day shout you'd like to make before yeah. we let you go? Yeah, I would like to to make a shout out to my girlfriend to my girlfriend uh, that yeah is 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 alone and it's my birthday, so yeah. I kind of left her alone to, <laughs> to play this to play this tournament. It's really sad for her, I guess. Well, I mean, it'll be happy once you finally rejoin yeah, her. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> for sure, absolutely. <laughs> All right, well, you know, you can celebrate tomorrow and just treat it as if you got a time machine where you can spend today, your birthday, <laughs> and Valentine's Day together celebrating. Congratulations, man. You're the fifth person to go to Winter Finals. We'll see you soon. Thank you, Froden. All right, so, so that was Ceriza, our fifth finalist. You know, I'm really glad that we got a chance to chat and get to know them more. The human element of Hearthstone is what really makes it compelling, right? Getting to see these people's reactions, getting to know their story a little bit more. And you, too, can be a person that does the same thing. That's what the entire championship tour is about. People who are watching now can even start picking up Hearthstone, start playing, and play for the next season in spring and summer, and ultimately for the last call, if that's with enough points you get. So make sure to try to sign up, and maybe it inspires you to play as well. And let us know what you guys think about too whether the games of Ceriza or about the entire process by joining us in the conversation hashtag HCT will we'll feature some of your tweets on the stream through play Twitter or play Hearthstone on Twitter and facebook.com slash Hearthstone. I'm Frodan and when we come back we're gonna have yet another match to see who will be joining us in California for the winter championships in March. Stay tuned we'll be right back. <laughs>